Top 10 Gary Rossington Songs Our list of Top 10 Gary Rossington Songs works like a roadmap for the Leonard Skinner guitarist's dog determination as his legend continued to thrive against steep odds. Along the way, Rossington suffered his share of health setbacks, yet he remained the band's stalwart original member. That meant collaborating on a series of cherished Southern rock albums through successive incarnations of Leonard Skinner, dating back to 1964 when Rossington joined up with his friends Ronnie Van Zandt and Alan Collins to form My Backyard in Jacksonville, Florida. Rossington described them as the Three Musketeers, and both the late Van Zandt and Collins play huge roles in our list of top 10 Gary Rossington songs. Together, they built a friendship that was as strong outside the studio. Rossington and Van Zandt, for instance, loved to fish together as it was inside. The lowest moment was surely the awful tragedy that decimated Leonard Skinner in the 70s. Several people, including Van Zandt and guitarist Steve Gaines, were killed in a plane crash while the rest of the group was gravely injured. But Rossington's story, like that of Skinner itself, continued and he made vital music in the years that followed. Our list includes plenty of music that the guitarist co-wrote in the classic era of Leonard Skinner, but we also touch on his work with fellow guitarist Collins and the Rossington Collins Band, along with Rossington's latter-day stint as the group's unquestioned post-reunion leader. Number 10. Things Go On Leonard Skinner From pronounced Leonard Skinner 1973 a scalding blues braze deep cut and an unlikely star turn, but even on a song in which co-writer Ronnie Van Zandt throws sharp barbs at politicos who ignore conditions on the ground, Rossington, whose lead lines help propel things going on with a stinging, Muscle Shoals-influenced groove, makes himself known. Number 9. Don't Stop Me Now Rossington Collins Band From This Is The Way, 1981 Co-written with tough vocalist Dale Krantz, a former backup singer with Point 38 Special who later married Rossington, the rough and randy Don't Stop Me Now showed how the guitarist could build off Leonard Skinner's familiar template even while surrounded by surviving former Skinner bandmates like Collins, Billy Powell, and Leon Wilkson. Number 8. Keeping the Faith Leonard Skinner from Leonard Skinner 1991-1991 Members of the Rossington Collins Band, along with Ronnie Van Zandt's kid brother Johnny, ultimately coalesced again as Leonard Skinner after a celebrated reunion tour. On record, Ronnie's straight razor wit was sorely missed, but as heard on the snarling Rossington-led anthem, the band had lost none of its bite. Number 7. One More Time Leonard Skinner from Street Survivors, 1977 a searching song originally demoed at Muscle Shoals for Leonard Skinner's shelf debut, One More Time, didn't see release until 1977, on the last album before everything changed. Rossington was joined in this lineup by Ed King, Ricky Medlock, and Greg Walker, rather than the current members Steve Gaines, Artemis Pyle, and Leon Wilkson. Number 6. One Good Man Rossington Collins Band from Anytime, Anyplace, Anywhere, 1980. Co-writer Dale Krantz offers a searching Janis Joplin-like vocal as Rossington reanimates Leonard Skinner's old multi-guitar magic by taking an early turn before giving way to a scorching Alan Collins solo. Standout moments like this one and Don't Misunderstand Me help push the Rossington Collins band's gold-selling debut album into the top 15. Number 5. Give Me Back My Bullets, Leonard Skinner, from Give Me Back My Bullets, 1976. Meant as a comeback message aimed at Billboard, the magazine would call an up-and-coming song, say, number 25 with a bullet, Give Me Back My Bullets, disappeared from Skinner's sets for a time. Seems literal-minded fans began to pelt them with actual bullets. Unfortunately, even Rossington's deliciously nasty work on this title track couldn't push the album past number 20. Number 4. Sweet Home Alabama, Leonard Skinner, from Second Helping, 1974. Rossington had his opening banjo-style riff he couldn't get out of his head, and after a while, Ronnie Van Zant began to write words for it. Those typically biting lyrics, they name-checked Neil Young's Southern Man specifically. 
would become a source of lingering controversy as Sweet Home Alabama hurtled to Leonard Skinner's highest ever finish, going to number 8 on the chart. Number 3. Don't Ask Me No Questions, Leonard Skinner from Second Helping, 1974. An often forgotten single that precedes Sweet Home Alabama, Don't Ask Me No Questions grew out of a much needed fishing trip Rossington took with Ronnie Van Zandt in the period after Leonard Skinner's debut album took off. The cutting riff, not to mention some raunchy horns, punctuate a leave me alone message from guys who are obviously still struggling to manage newfound fame. Thing is, they were about to become a wild lot bigger. Number 2. What's Your Name? Leonard Skinner from Street Survivors, 1977. Skinner added Steve Gaines after Gimme Back My Bullets, producing perhaps their most complete studio effort and certainly their best arranged. But Rossington kicked things off with this album opening statement of purpose, written with Ronnie Van Zandt in a hotel room on the road about the things that often occur in just such a place. Released days before the fatal plane crash, What's Your Name rose to number 13. Number 1. Simple Man, Leonard Skinner, from Pronounced Leonard Skinner, 1973. Gary Rossington and Ronnie Van Zandt began this anthemic album closer in a moment of sad remembrance after losing their mother and grandmother respectively. Producer Al Cooper reportedly added his organ parts later and cautioned Leonard Skinner against releasing the song. Fans had the final say, however, and Simple Man with a solo by Rossington that sounds like his mind melding with Alan Collins remained a concert favorite for decades. Buffalo Springfield Last Time Around, 1968 It was already a miracle that Buffalo Springfield again, the band's second LP sounded somewhat cohesive after its strained, protracted recording sessions. But by 1968, all the non-musical issues within and surrounding the band, including multiple drug-related arrests and lineup shifts, came to a breaking point, with Buffalo Springfield splitting in May. Last Time Around arrived two months later, apparently as a contractual obligation, bundling unreleased tracks from early 1968 and the prior year. Surprisingly, giving the afterthought vibe, it became their highest charting LP, hitting number 42. The Jimi Hendrix Experience, Electric Ladyland, 1968. It gets messy trying to figure out Jimi Hendrix's final album, Band of Gypsies is a 1970 live LP without his longtime backing band, The Experience, but it does feature new songs. Then there's the wave of posthumous records, like 1971's The Cry of Love, that are by definition unofficial but still feature some top shelf material. The obvious choice for our list is 1968's Electric Ladyland, an ambitious double LP that expanded the experience universe beyond the tight powered trio format. All Along the Watchtower, a psychedelic cover of Bob Dylan tune features the Rolling Stones' Brian Jones on percussion. Traffic flautist Chris Wood pops up on 1983, a merman I should turn to be. R&B group The Sweet Inspirations offer backing vocals on Burning of the Midnight Lamp and both Hammond organist Steve Winwood and Jefferson Airplane bassist Jack Cassidy team with Hendrix for the slow blues showstopper Voodoo Chili. That experimentation led to Hendrix's first and only number one album in the US. Cream, Goodbye, 1969 At least when Cream announced their studio farewell, they actually stuck with it. The Power Trio's Goodbye LP was appropriately titled, arriving after they'd already announced a farewell tour for 1968. And while they originally planned a half-studio, half-live package similar to the preceding Wills of Fire, they only wound up with enough quality cuts for one disc, balancing new compositions like the Eric Clapton anthem Badge with old-life war horses like Politician and I'm So Glad. Clapton, Jack Bruce, and Ginger Baker did reunite in 1993 for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction performance, followed by a quartet of shows in 2005. Goodbye, though, remained true to its title. Sadly, Bruce and Baker died in 2014 and 2019, respectively. The Beatles, Abbey Road, 1969. Abbey Road is the most confusing final album in rock history. Here's the famous timeline. 
The Beatles recorded the Back to Basics Get Back in 1969, shelved the results, regrouped that year to record one more classic album with fuller production and overdubs, Abbey Road, and finally issued a retooled version of Get Back with controversial production from Phil Spector under the name Let It Be in 1970. So even if the latter album is their final release, it wasn't really their final product. Abbey Road, featuring intricately arranged singles like Something and Come Together along with the second side suite, was their true swan song. Janis Joplin, Pearl, 1971 When Janis Joplin died from a heroin overdose on October 4, 1970, the recording sessions for her second solo LP were almost complete. Working with Doors producer Paul A. Rothschild and a new backing group dubbed the Full Tilt Boogie Band, Joplin had spent four months recording a batch of hand-picked tunes, primarily covers like a rousing take on Chris Christopherson and Fred Foster's roots rock classic Me and Bobby McGee, which later hit number one, with a couple of originals mixed in. Her raw a cappella co-wrote Mercedes Benz, Three days after recording the latter tune, she was dead at age 27. The album, which soared to number one in the US, was already finished, with the exception of the full tilt instrumental Buried Alive in the Blues, which she never got a chance to sing on. The Doors, LA Woman, 1971 after toughening up their sound on 1970's Morrison Hotel, The Doors committed further to that swaggering, stripped-down aesthetic on LA Woman on their last album with frontman Jim Morrison. Several tracks, including the titular centerpiece, dug deeper into the frontman's beloved blues, but the quartet hadn't completely lost their psychedelic spirit, evidenced by Ray Mazarek's Funhouse Vox Continental solo on Love Her Madly and Robbie Krieger's rippling guitar atmospheres of closing epic, Riders on the Storm. Less than three months after LA Woman, Morrison was dead at age 27, officially due to heart failure. His former bandmates carried on, releasing three more albums, 1971's Other Voices, 1972's Full Circle and 1978's An American Prayer, the latter featuring posthumous spoken word performances by Morrison. <laughs>